fett. Salut Minus. C'est ta fille From a former French first lady to one of cinema's leading ladies behind the camera, that's all coming up on today's show. I'm joined by our film critic, as always, Lisa Nesselson. Lisa, hello to you. Lisa, we are starting with a film that's not really a biopic, but it is very much about genuine French history and a real public figure. This is Bernadette Chirac, the wife of former French president Jacques Chirac. Now, the title character is played by none other than Catherine Deneuve, who, for those of us keeping track, is soon to turn. 80. Uh, Lisa, tell us about Bernadette. I love that poster. This is a joyous <laughs> comedy anchored in French political circles from 1977 when often slippery career politician Jacques Chirac was mayor of Paris, a job he held until 1995 when he was elected president, a position he held until 2007 when his ambitious enemy Nicolas Sarkozy got the job. First-time director Lea Dominic has the outstanding idea to set the affectionately irreverent tone from the outset. A melodious church choir sings, yes, sings, essential background information accompanied by the lyrics spelled out in noble Gothic lettering. They warn us that this is about Bernadette, but not strictly accurate. The real Bernadette is still alive. She's 90, and uh, Jacques Chirac died in 2019, where her husband projects energy and vitality uh, and virility and has a notorious eye for ladies other than his wife. Uh, Bernadette is seen as fusty and old world. Let's take a look at a political wife in action. Les gens vous trouvent ringarde. Bonjour, Madame Chirac. Bonjour, Malinier. Froide. 198. Bonjour, Madame. Bonjour, Madame Chirac. Euh, austère. <coughs> Acariâtre à égalité avec Revêche. Oui, moi, ça va, j'ai compris. Mais pas de panique. Nous allons faire en sorte que les Français découvrent votre vrai visage. Il va falloir apprendre à désobéir, Madame Chirac. I have to say, Catherine Deneuve is a very uh, glamorous version of Bernadette Chirac. And Bernadette in the film often finds herself sidelined. And that is something, Lisa, that she does not like one bit. No, Bernadette, who is herself an elected representative from her native region, Carrez, and is appreciated by her constituents there, decides she has had it with being stepped on and decides to take steps to assert her personality. Now, this includes a new wardrobe. Karl Lagerfeld is as sure in his fashion instincts as she is in her political ones. Now, Bernadette, we see her being swatted away when she warns her husband and his all-male cabinet that it'll be a very risky move to dissolve the National Assembly and call for elections, as he's planning to do. This was due to a legitimate fear of people switching their allegiance from Chirac to Jean-Marie Le Pen's xenophobic and retrograde party. Bernadette, alas, was right. Chirac's power was diluted, not cemented. Slick and dangerous Le Pen's shared the runoff ballot. In addition to the choir, the director's other very fine idea is to insert genuine footage from the events cited throughout the film. And speaking of archival footage, Lisa, we're going to take a look at some. Here is what Bernadette told French television about the role of First Lady back in 1981. The French are about to elect a president, and not a presidential family. I feel that, consequently, my role needs to be modest and discreet. I think that my role is not to be a political advisor. Now, the first time Jacques wins, he condescendingly gives Bernadette a list of things to tend to, and in leaving the room, proclaims how lucky she is to have married him. By then, we're rolling our eyes so that she doesn't have to, but Catherine Deneuve doesn't have to roll her eyes for us to understand how her Bernadette is feeling. Deneuve gives an absolutely delightful comic performance. With the slightest adjustment of her expression, she conveys exasperation or empathy. And one of the funniest segments is when news anchors on TV, so real footage, are seen announcing an important meeting between Clinton and Chirac. But it turns out that it's Hillary Clinton and Bernadette Chirac. <laughs> Jacques can't believe his eyes. The first lady of the United States is in France and I don't know about it. 
Again, love seeing that archive footage. All right, Lisa, meanwhile, we're gonna move on to another woman who found a way to thrive and triumph in a male-dominated world. She's the subject of a retrospective, including films, installations, and artifacts at the Cinémathèque Française. Now, before Lisa tells us more about it, here's a glimpse of the incredible cornucopia of offerings for Viva Varda. Qu'est-ce que c'est que le bonheur? Quelles notions en ont-ils? Toutes portes ouvertes en plein courant d'air. Je suis une maison vide sans toi, sans toi. Now, Anya Svarda, who died in 2019 at age 90, directed her first film back in 1955 while leading an outstanding career as a still photographer. She has been dubbed the godmother of the French New Wave, but hasn't gotten enough credit, I think, until now, perhaps, for exploring formal and off-the-cuff experiments in filmic storytelling. Not one of her films could have been made by anybody else, and for me, that's the mark of an artist. Now, she was one of the first filmmakers to see the potential of lightweight video cameras to make films. She made the instant classic, The Gleaners and I. She was also very drawn to making documentaries. That's one. She made two documentaries about Jane Bergen. And Lisa, as you said, Agnes Varda is the godmother of new wave cinema. But for those of us who don't know her work so well, perhaps, where's a good place to start? Well, if you only have one day to live, you'll die happy if you take in 1962's Cléo de saint Cassette, Cléo from 5 to 7, the gripping tale of a beautiful French singer who wanders around Paris in real time, waiting to find out whether her lab test has turned up cancer or not. It features a radiant Corinne Marchand, the young Michel Legrand, and the streets of Paris. And you can also enjoy within it a fake silent movie interlude featuring Jean-Luc Godard and Anna Karina. And her 1985 fiction film, Sans Toi Ni Loi, Vagabond in English, is an uncompromising portrait of a young woman played by Sandrine Bonner, homeless by choice, and the people whose paths she crossed. Toward the end of her life, Varda enjoyed a joyful collaboration with the artist J.R., whose stock in trade is gargantuan photos of regular people pasted up on mostly public surfaces. They're a good pairing. I have to second the recommendation for Cléo de saint Set. Very memorable moment from my French classes. <laughs> Lisa, the next film you're going to tell us about is from a first-time director, Iris Kaltenbach. The Rapture stars Havzia Herzi as a midwife who loves her job and is good at it, but has no child of her own until something happens. Yes, and the something that happens is what makes this movie so fascinating and suspenseful. I'll try to talk my way around it because this movie is a very human drama and a near existential thriller full of unpredictable twists and turns. Now, it's common knowledge that the arrival of a child can alter the dynamics in a romantic couple. But this film addresses the effect of a newborn for one half of a formerly rock-solid symbiotic friendship between two women. Lydia and Salome are really, really, really best friends. When Salome announces she's pregnant, Lydia is so swept up in her friend's happiness that she never gets around to telling Salome that her long-term boyfriend has just dumped her without warning. Hmm. And it's perhaps worth noting that the French title, Le Ravissement, can also mean abduction. Let's take a look at The Rapture. Lydia m'a dit un jour qu'elle pensait qu'un tuyau invisible la reliait à son ami. Comme si elle se partageait une seule dose de bonheur pour deux. Si Salomé allait vivre comme certains l'affirment le plus beau jour de sa vie, qu'allait-il se passer pour elle Faut que t'arrêtes de m'envoyer des textos. Je cherche un de plus. besoin de retracer cette histoire dans son point de vue. Dans l'espoir de reconstituer le vrai visage de Lydia. Now Salome has an exhaustingly difficult labor and in a gripping scene Lydia coaches her to push some more, while others start suggesting calling in the doctor or performing a cesarean section. There's a real feeling that Lydia may be making poor decisions, but the little girl is born at last. A chance encounter in an elevator with a one-night stand of Lydia's leads to a lie 
concerning the newborn, and the film then concerns itself with the question yes. of whether Lydia is a born oh. manipulator who has been passing for oh, a productive like member of society, or simply blurted out a spontaneous fib that led down an increasingly complex rabbit hole. Viewers are gradually clued into the identity of the man providing the voiceover we heard there as he tries to piece together how the fallout from a one-night stand led to the witness stand. Ooh, I'm definitely intrigued by that one. All right, finally, Lisa, out this week in France is a restored Naked Lunch, David Cronenberg's 1991 adaptation of the wild and supposedly unadaptable novel by William Burroughs. Well, if anybody was going to find ways to transfer Burroughs' drug-fueled paranoid imagery to the big screen, Cronenberg was born for the job. Burroughs has made literature feel cinematic, and Cronenberg has often applied his skills to that same challenge. How do you capture in words or images the freewheeling dreams and nightmares of characters in the grip of dicey situations? Cronenberg acknowledged that a straight translation into film would, quote, cost $400 million and be banned in every country in the world. He found a less costly alternative, but I think it mostly works. All right, well, we will leave everyone with the distinctive the distinctive visuals of Naked Lunch. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, thank you so much, as always, for bringing us the highlights from film this week. Uh, thank you all for watching. For more arts and culture news, you can always check out our website. There's news coming up here on France 24. You're just going to have to leave town. Tourist class, I'm afraid. you were finished with doing weird stuff. I thought I was too, but I guess I'm not.